It includes uh, information architecture, workflows, usability, learnability, discoverability, uh, aesthetics, the visual design of the interface is very important too, micro-interactions, but user experience is smaller than that. Um, so it's even the emotional responses that, that these interactions cause. And all of them make up the user experience. Um, the term is sometimes used in an even broader sense, uh, broader context. For example, it would be quite reasonable to say that the Unity forums is part of the, the overall user experience of Unity. If you're a developer, there's a, a good chance that you're spending a lot of time there. Um, another example, an event like this, Unite Soul, it's, um, it's also part of the uh, broader Unity experience. Um, when, when it comes to our team, though, the, the user experience team, that's uh, spanning, we're not, we're not spanning, but wide. Um, we can't cover all those areas. We are more focused on the editor itself. So, this uh, pillar diagram, it shows uh, the editor sessions in 2011 and 2014, just last year. So, when we're interested in measuring editor sessions, it's because it shows us um, how active users are. And we can even see uh, geographically where most of the user activity is. And the uh, magenta part here, or reddish blocks, that's, uh, that's Korea. And it's, it's, uh, Korea is a huge country in terms of Unity users and and, and uh, the activity of, uh, of Unity users here is enormous. Actually, Korea is like number four in the world in terms of Unity users, right after uh, uh, China is number one, um, the United States is number two, then Japan. And you're just balanced, but it's, it's uh, the third place is just on a nice edge between Japan and uh, you're almost the same size. Um, so, in 2011, we did not have a user experience team at Unity. But at that time, it, it was not as important. That doesn't mean that we were not focusing on user experience at that, at that point. At the time, it was just easier because Unity was simpler, there were fewer features, and the amount of feedback we got from users were, it was just easier to handle. So with this increase of user activity, you can imagine that there's a lot to, of feedback to digest. Um, we have all already been uh, getting user feedback from a number of places, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, the Alpha, Alpha and Beta groups, oh, the Unity forums, of course, uh, bug reports, support, that's the, uh, the enterprise customers, so he was that. Um, field engineers and evangelists, they are some of the people at Unity that, that they know are the best, they are because they know me. But at, uh, with the user, we're doing, we are getting different kinds of feedback, and this is what uh, Nevin will now talk to you about. So, um, during development of a feature, we are applying different user experience methods, and I will uh, just talk about some of them today. So, I will talk about card sorting and the Carno model, which is a survey form. And I will talk about uh, contextual inquiry. And uh, we will also talk about a love letter that we wrote on Valentine's Day. And uh, then we will also talk about the Think Aloud protocol. So, card sorting is 
As you can see, there's a bunch of cards. Uh, it's a research method to investigate how our users are thinking about structure, uh, names, and grouping of items. It's a research method to understand the mental model of our users. So with mental model, what I mean is that it's like a metaphor for how we understand the world. Um, mental models are like detailed understandings of how systems work. For instance, uh, I have a background in audio design, so my understanding of the audio mixer is different than, for instance, a person who's doing graphical design. So, and we all have like different understandings of systems. So, this is the Kana model. Uh, the Kana model is like a, um, it's one of our favorite research models, and it was uh, developed by Professor Noriaki Kano in the 1980s. And it's uh, part of this model is like a circle form that is used to understand the user satisfaction. Um, so this is like an example from uh, of a question from a Kano survey. So the way we do these surveys is that we ask a functional and a dysfunctional question. And the reason for doing this is that we want to understand the level of user satisfaction. So it's and it's also because like if you have like two uh, data points, then it's easier or you can more precisely find the level of user satisfaction. So when we collect the data from the Kano surveys, we plot it and we need to evaluate it. We plot it into a um, into a chart like this, and uh, by doing so, it uh, you can see how satisfied satisfied uh, users are with a certain feature. So, contextual inquiry. This is also a method that we use a lot. Uh, it's a method that is borrowed from ethnographical studies, in which researchers they go out to the natural habitat of users and observe how they work. So when we do it, we visit the developer and we sit next to them and uh, ask them to explain what they are doing. So while they're doing this uh, contextual inquiry, we are taking on different roles. So the developer that we are observing is the master and we are the apprentices what we are learning from the master. So, last week, for instance, uh, we, in Tokyo, we uh, visited five game studios, and it means so much for us that we can visit you, our users, and we got, got a lot of uh, valuable feedback. So, but what we did in, in Tokyo was a different type of user research. So the type of user research we did was more like a conversation with developers and artists about some of the workflow issues that they are experiencing when working in Unity. So um, this is a love letter from Unity. So on Valentine's Day, we took a chance, the user experience team took a chance on our users. We wrote you a love letter and we posted a blog about it. And in the blog post, we encouraged our users to respond to it by writing either a love letter or a breakup letter or they could send us some sort of response in whatever form that they wanted. So, and we got a lot of responses, and um, some of them came, and they came in various forms. So,
Some of them were like letters, like this one, or some people, some users sent us poems, and uh, this one is a rap song. And um, but we also got some other types of like other forms of responses, and such as like this uh, burning heart that is. Um, Created as a shader and was created by Boris Novikov. So the thing about one, uh, the thing about protocol is uh, it's one of the most important methods for uh, testing usability and use it all the time. Uh, this picture is from our user experience lab back in Copenhagen. Um, so what we do is when when our developers are working on a new feature, we we'll, we we'll get uh, real Unity users to come into our lab and and test the feature uh, periodically while the feature is being developed. And we have this. Uh, so we are we're getting the, the users that we get to come to come to our lab. They are. Uh, chosen uh, based on, on what type of, of feature it is and hopefully we will get people that are uh, that are the target audience for that for that feature. Um, we would have liked to show you uh, some footage from those tests because they are they're super interesting. Every time it's like it's like a lesson of a lesson in interaction design. You always learn something new. Um, but uh, of course, we're not that, that uh, footage is confidential. So instead, we have this video um, that is a pretty good example of how these tests take place. Um, the video is approximately four minutes and has Korean subtitles. What is this? What is that? Uh, a computer? Oh, it's an old computer. That's cool. I like pressing buttons. It's huge. It's very huge. If you don't have a desk, where do you put this? It feels very hipster. What do you think of it just from looking at it? Kind of like those old televisions that are like very boxy. Go ahead, turn it on. Um. I think that one. So you turn the monitor on. Where else might an on switch be? Hello? How do I do this? It's uh, in the back. Oh. oh, I see where it is. Why does it have to make so much noise? And there's nothing on the screen. It doesn't look anything like what we have now. Apps, games, websites. Yeah. 
hardest thing in the world. So what you need to do is you have to type the word print first. Oh, math has nothing to do with print. I don't get how you have to put print. Nothing prints out. That won't work. Thank you. 
for audio designers. But when we did the Think Aloud test, we quickly found out that it actually made it much more complex for audio designers to use. And some of our users expressed that they were missing something. They couldn't exactly say what they were missing, but they were missing something. So after the uh, uh, user feedback, we scraped the old design and came up with this, uh, as it is in the audio mixer today. And so as you can see, it has like a threshold, ratio, attack time, release time, makeup, gain, need, and assign chain mix. So it's, these are actually also the parameters that you will see in a compressor in a music program. So what we found out was that audio designers, they used to have many parameters and variables that they can control. So doing it simple by giving very few controls actually made the whole experience complex for them. So this is how it looks today. So another very important lesson we learned was, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but uh, in the audio mixer, we have a button called Edit and Play Mode. So, and what it does is that when you press the Edit and Play Mode button, then you can tweak and um, adjust your audio mixer settings at runtime. Now, this is a very important feature for audio designers. It means that they can instantly get feedback of uh, the soundscape in the scene. So, and this is like a must-have feature for audio designers. So, but in the, again, early stages of uh, development, the button had uh, a different name, which was Edit Snapshots. So, technically, that was what the audio designers were doing. But because, because uh, the audio designers did not uh, relate the name snapshot to how they were working in the editor. So they completely ignored this button. So this like very super cool feature, they completely ignored it. But after we changed the name to edit and play mode, it was more intuitive for them to understand and they found the button much quicker. So um, I will talk a bit about uh, global animation, and um, so this was also a very interesting test for us. And um, well, we've had the light mapping system in the, the unit editor since version three, and but in uh, five oh it has been replaced. And uh, so, it was, so what we wanted to investigate was how our users would understand this new light mapping system. And the results of our test, our tests revealed actually that our users didn't understand the new system. Because the reason was that they were applying the old mental model from the old light mapping system to the new one. So this was a bit um, so um, the way that we did the testing for global animation was that we recruited seven, uh, seven test subjects from the Copenhagen area and they also all had very varied um, profiles. Some were students and very new to Unity and others were like very technical and experts and have been using Unity for the past five plus years. So, um, in order for us to communicate the results of the Think Aloud test to our developers, we made some cartoons. So, and the reason that we did it was because it was easier for us to communicate about the problems that our users experience when they use the new light mapping system. So what we have here is Jonas. He, he, he has like one and a half years of experience. 
in the Unity and he's a happy hobbyist. And we have this cartoon profile book then. He has four years of experience and he's like able all around that. He programs and he makes graphics and how to do sounds. And then we have uh, Thomas who has uh, five plus years of experience and he's the expert, the type of an expert user. And, uh, and also works professionally in the games industry. So, but I should also tell you that this is not like, Jonas is not a person, it's his, uh, this is just a profile that is based off like a wide range of users that we, that we did the testing with. But this is, the reason that we do this is that when we are discussing with the developers and talking about the pain points that our users have, it's uh, it's easier to, to empathize with the, the issues that our users are experiencing when they're using the light mapping system. So this kind of ties in to the persona project that we just started. And also part of the reason that why we've come here to Asia. So, and I should tell you a bit about what a persona is. So, a persona is a fictitious character where you build up a narrative about a certain certain type of user. And this narrative that we build up uh, around a persona. It's not just something that we make up, it's based on uh, interviews and research with real Unity users. Um, and the reason that we're doing this so is so when we develop a feature, we can empathize with the user and understand how uh, different types of uh, user profiles work in the editor. So, a part of the, uh, of the Persona project is also to collect artifacts from our users. We want to know what your lives are like as game developers or whatever uh, type of life you have using Unity. Um, so we created this hashtag, or well, we're using this hashtag, um, and we would really like if you would send us pictures from your lives. It can be pictures of anything, maybe uh, maybe your desk at work, or uh, or your way to work, or the people in your lives, maybe your favorite thing, anything really. Thanks for listening.